Okay, great. Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, looks like some people are still coming in, but we're really happy to have everybody here. Um, that you are in the session PD01, Avenues into Integration, Communicating Taxonomic Intelligence from Sender to Recipient. And uh, I'm your one of your moderators, Nate Upham. My, my co-moderator is Beckett Sterner. And we're from Arizona State University. We're grateful to have uh, tech support tonight from Kate Ingloff and Ellie Wallace. I guess it's, it's morning or depends on what time of day, depends on where you are. Thanks everybody for joining us amidst other things like presidential debates and whatnot. Um, and so just to let you know, this session will be recorded for later viewing. Um, and yeah, we're gonna have a session where our format is gonna have several talks initially. Um, you can see that in this notes document that has been shared a few times and we'll continue to share it throughout. Um, we've got six talks, I think, and then a about a little less than an hour for discussion. Just want everyone to know about the code of conduct and to keep your microphones muted. And hopefully we'll, we'll have a smooth session. Um, and I think we can go ahead and get started. Becca, did you want to add anything? No, that sounds great. Okay, cool. Um, let me get my slides going here. I guess while you pull it up, um, I think we'll be running chat either. I can keep track of folks who raise hands um, or uh, the chat window. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, when to do questions, but we'll have a couple of minutes after each talk and then the longer session at the end. Great. OK, everybody's seeing, seeing that? Yeah, great. OK. so. Yeah, avenues into integration, um, communicating taxonomic intelligence from sender to recipient, and um, sort of sort of this this initial idea that we're going to be talking about tonight is um, thinking about pluralism. So this idea that you don't necessarily need to always have consensus, uh, and there's ways to manage dissent, uh, sort of versus this juxtaposing against ideas that, that really push you towards consensus. So the IUCN Red List as an example where you have these conservation decisions where um, it's difficult currently to manage dissent. And so this, uh, we have this sort of brief quote in our uh, abstract, and this is the full quote from, uh, from Resher 2000. What is crucial for your ability to communicate with me um, is ultimately that it pivots on the recipient's capacity to interpret, to make good inferential sense of the meanings that the declarer is able to send. And so there's, there's some more context there if you wanna, wanna read. Um, ultimately, you know, this is an idea that's been successful in philosophy and continues to be uh, integrated into politics and different types of affairs. And so we think that it can be helpful for taxonomy to sort of navigate these uh, socio-scientific spaces. So ultimately, we're, tonight we're talking about this communicating taxonomic intelligence from sender to recipient. And this could be sort of rephrased as intelligently communicating taxonomic names and meaning from sender to recipient. So here, thinking about you know, an investigator as the sender and then it could be, you know, a citizen scientist as the recipient. Um, in this case, we would certainly, uh, if we're talking about any kind of big data, you know, there's, there's all these intermediaries, right? So maybe this investigator was doing gene sequencing and had geospatial data, and then that was being served through iNaturalist. And so we want this, um, you know, this meaning to be retained throughout this whole process. So thinking about, this is sort of how, how I came into this question was thinking about mammal taxonomy and particularly the change through time. And so if we go back to you know, 1982 here when the first uh, mammal species of the world was released and kind of into the present, 
um, with these uh, mammal diversity database, which is something that I've been uh, part of putting together. Uh, you really see that this, this sort of linear trajectory of you know, taxonomy as a science continues to sort of refine our understanding of taxonomic and evolutionary relationships. And then that's reflected in uh, mammal names and, and their meanings. So you can sort of juxtapose that with the way that conservation science, um, like sort of the, the state of the art has been much, much flatter, right? So think tracing from 2008 to the present, there's much more of a, a pressure to keep things consistent, even in the face of change. And so just recently in 2020, IUCN finally did split some species that are, were strongly supported, but there's still quite a bit of resistance to this. And in particular, we think because there's this pressure to have consensus rather than manage dissent. And so there's this question of how can we manage dissent rather than require consensus? We'll kind of guide our discussion tonight. And so another kind of example of this, you know, why do we, we need to know how many species of mammals there are for questions like understanding species level evolutionary history, which is kind of how I came into this. Um, as well as you know, more topically relevant, especially um, is trying to understand the spillover of viral pathogens to humans. And so all of this data is also linked to mammal taxonomy, as we saw mammal taxonomy changes through time. So we need to understand, um, we need to be able to track these types of uh, relationships, these ecological interactions intelligently. And this leads to Beckett's slides. Yeah, um, thanks. So uh, in thinking about how to manage dissent, there have been, rather than um, necessarily converge on a single list that everyone shares, some of the key issues there is, well, how do you do that at scale, right? I mean, it's one thing to have, uh, you know, a, a bunch of synonyms, um, but if you really want to keep track of uh, individual uh, name usages and how one person is using a name in, in this usage and another person uh, on a different usage, um, that definitely augments the complexity. So um, how do we make progress on scaling up uh, in terms of being able to communicate what we mean from uh, sender to recipient and, and back? And then second, um, if in some cases, simplicity might be good enough, right? Maybe you just need names that are matched by a, a kind of fuzzy string method. Maybe synonyms are good enough. Um, under what circumstances can you really show a benefit to handling the full alignments between taxonomic name usages? And I think um, showing when and where it's really worth it um, is an important challenge moving forward. Um, let me go to the next slide. And um, just to dive in onto some directions for current work, and these are sort of to foreshadow some of the things that I think we'll get to talk about and, and see in the presentations. Um, so how can we learn alignments uh, of taxonomic names and their meanings from scientific texts or from specimen metadata, for example, from images? Uh, AI has potential there to help uh, bridge and automate some of that process of generating the, the name usage maps. Um, how can we automate translation? You know, so if someone uh, changes their taxonomy over here and have a bunch of data and they wanna share with someone over there who has a different set of uh, uh, name usages, how can we automate the translation back and forth and the checking, right? The querying, uh, providing provenance for how things, uh, the, the meanings and the data are changing. And um, this also gets to, you know, th these are problems in, in mammals and in plants uh, and in uh, microbiology and in all the different areas. And um, we're starting to see tools and approaches developing in local initiatives and projects, uh, but maybe there's um, some gains there in terms of scalability of coordinating development and, and directions. All right, let's go to the next slide. And um, on the side of demonstrating value, uh, you know, I've been uh, digging through the literature and finding papers that quantify the value of, of synonyms, for example, and discovering data or scientific articles, um, but really showing the, the quantitative value to conservation or information discovery of having taxonomic name usages, I think is still a really important question and something that could be addressed um, very powerfully. Um, showing how these problems for biodiversity can actually drive 
basic innovation in informatics and AI, right, for the rest of science, I think is a really important value uh, or way of, of showing value. And then finally, um, demonstrating how it pulls people in um, and, you know, to what extent does it really extend and deepen uh, communities of practice and networks of exchange when folks get to have their local views or coordinate with the, the local constraints and resources they, they have in terms of the taxonomic classifications or tools that they're using. And so um, that's just kind of seed the discussion with these directions for where we can go. And I think the papers are going to do a nice job of exploring some of these uh, as, as we move forward. And then the last slide here is just to give you a roadmap for the rest of uh, the session. So we've got talks um, from uh, Gaurav Vaija, Alex Chapman, um, Anne Francis and Leah Oliver, Atria Sen, Nico Franz, and then Jonathan Reese. And um, for each of these, the plan is that we'll have eight minutes for the presentation. And I think Nate will be timekeeping. And then um, we can do you know, quick, a quick question basically at the end of each um, if there's something that came up. And then uh, the, the more substantive stuff we can keep to the end and we'll have a good long time uh, for everyone to talk after that. Great. Okay, yeah, and so I guess we'll just jump right into to Gaurav. Hi, everybody. My name is Gaurav Aitya, and I'm from the University of North Carolina. I'm going to be talking about enabling machines to integrate biodiversity data with evolutionary knowledge. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to be, uh, how my talk's going to go today, I'm going to start with some background about clades and clade definitions and then recap something that we've already presented at a previous DADWIG, uh, a technique we use to transform clade definitions into ontologies, which we call phyloreferences. Then I'm gonna to come to the big question that I'm talking about tonight, which is how can we aggregate data from big biodiversity resources using clade definitions? And then I'll conclude. So what is a clade? A clade represents a branch in the tree of life. It's a group of organisms that consist of a common ancestor and all of its descendants. It is a taxon concept. This is uh, usually visualized as a phylogeny, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. And clades are a pretty fundamental idea in biology for thinking about how organisms and species and taxa are related to each other. Now, usually when you label uh, nodes on these phylogenies, you repurpose linear names. But doing so is, a, is problematic. Linear names and taxon concepts can't be reconciled easily. Names are text strings that require expert interpretation and their meaning is not computable. In practice, this means that when these higher taxo taxonomic names are being applied to a phylogeny, this is something, this is a manual process that has to be done to bring these names into an evolutionary based framework, something they weren't originally conceptualized to be in. There is an alternate approach, which is one that we've been uh, working on in this project called phylogenetic definitions. Phylogenetic definitions were proposed in the late 1980s, and so they've been around for quite a while. And they are a way of defining clades based on the species or uh, the taxonomic units that are found inside of the clade or just outside of the clade. I won't go into these three types of phylogenetic definitions in much detail here, but I will be walking you through a node-based minimum clade definition over the next couple of slides. And I'll be doing that with a tool, which we used to call the curation tool, but now we call CLADOS, which we've previously demonstrated at Tadwig. So here's a uh, clade definition for a clade called lobelioidy, which is a group of flowering plants. Um, the definition that we're using, which was created by one of my co-authors of in, in this presentation, uh, goes the crown clade originating in the most recent common ancestor of two species, which are Lobelia cardinalis and Lobelia coronipifolia. So it's a pretty simple definition. And the idea is that if we have a phylogeny that has these two species in them, we can figure out which clade should be the Lobelioidae clade, since it's the most recent common ancestor of those two uh, species and all of its descendants. For the way in which CLADOS works, we break that definition down into specifiers, which are these two units of taxonomy, and say that these are internal specifiers. They're the ones that, we, that need to be inside of the clade, which provides a minimum clade or a node-based definition. Once we have this definition in CLADOS, 
we can then, oh, that's the internal specifiers there. We can then um, resolve it on a given phylogeny, as long as that phylogeny has those two species. So here on the right, you can see Lobelia coronipifolia, and below that, some ways down, Lobelia cardinalis. And on the left, you can see that we're highlighting the lobelioidy clade. So this is all stuff that we previously demonstrated at Tadwig. But for this, uh, at Tadwig 2018, in fact, this Tadwig, we wanted to, uh, oh, sorry, forgot this bit. Um, so what's going on under the hood here is that we're translating this, uh, log this definition into a logical expression in the web ontology language, or OWL. OWL is a standard format for representing ontologies, which means that this definition isn't just machine readable now, it's a semantically rich uh, definition that explains exactly how these specifiers should be um, relate to each other in order to find this clade. So uh, this is something that any off the shelf owl reasoner can do given this definition that we've produced. So this is what we call a phylo reference, a semantically rich machine readable logic definition of a clade using a property that's common to all of life, which is uh, descent. So, all of that was stuff that we've previously demonstrated at Tadwig. For tonight's talk, I wanted to think about how do we aggregate data from big biodiversity resources using phylo references. So first of all, we need a big phylogeny, a phylogeny that's likely to have all of these specifiers, all of these taxonomic units that people might want to use in their clade definitions. The phylogeny we decided to use is the open tree of life, which is a synthetic phylogeny made up of over 1,000 phylogenies, which were computationally linked to each other, as well as taxonomic checklists to provide a massive phylogeny with over 2 million tips across all of the major, across all of the domains of life. So this is a major achievement and they've got some really great APIs. So we built a tool called the Open Tree Resolver, which connects our uh, technology with the Open Tree technology using their APIs. So we can load in a uh, phylo reference um, you know, in, in, as, an, as an owl ontology. And the software identifies the specifiers, those two species that this um, phylo reference refers to. We can then query the open tree taxonomy to find the open tree taxonomy IDs for these species and ask the open tree of life to provide what's called an induced subtree. The induced subtree consists of a tree that just tells us how these two species are related to each other. As you can see on the bottom of the screen, that's actually a really simple tree just for these two species. But the open tree resolver is designed to be able to handle multiple phylo references, in which case you'll get a much more complex phy uh, phylo phylogeny. Now, once you have a phylogeny and the, the phylo references, we can put them into an owl reasoner and come up with a resolved open tree node which in this case is MRCA, OTT, blah, 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 blah. If you click on that node, um, we come to this node on the open tree of life. Now, there's three things I wanna highlight here. First of all, this node isn't labeled lobelioide. In fact, the open tree of life has no idea what lobelioide is, but we've gone straight from the definition of lobelioide to a node in the open tree of life because we have this definition. Secondly, the open tree of life combines information from phylogenies, which are the ones with solid lines at the top of the screen, as well as taxonomic checklists, which are the dashed lines below that. As more phylogenies are included in the open tree, we would expect to see uh, this, this graph become more detailed. At that point, our definition will probably point to a different node in the open tree of life, but it will still point to the node referred to by that definition. Finally, the way in which we link this to biodiversity data is that this node has 1,350 descendant tips. We can ask the open tree API for the list of all the species among those tips, and then map them to GBIF species IDs by using the GBIF API. That lets us access all of the GBIF data to do with this node. Um, we could do this on any biodiversity resource, such as iDigBio. So now you're probably wondering, okay, we have this cool technology, but what clay definitions can I actually look up? Earlier this year, the Regnum website was published, which has a list of um, almost 300 clay definitions. So we've been working on digitizing them into phylo references and resolving them over the open tree of life. And this is just a few of the resolutions that we have. So uh, thus far, you can see some of them have the same name and in some cases they don't have a label at all, 
like with lobelioidy. So in conclusion, phyloreferences references can be machine resolved right now on the open tree of life and can be used to retrieve data from biodiversity databases. So just like to acknowledge our funding from the National Science Foundation and the Open Tree of Life team who worked with us to integrate our software and who are in fact just released an API that allows you to do some amount of clay definition resolution directly on the Open Tree of Life. Thanks so much. All right, awesome. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, we have a uh, minute or two if go ahead and raise your hand um, using the uh, Zoom participants uh, window, or you can put a question in chat and uh, I can either read it for you, you can jump in with audio. Gaurav, could I ask about the the regnum a little bit? Like, uh, yeah. sorry, but what, could you explain that a little better? Yeah, no worries. So regnum is a database of uh, clay definitions that was published, that was released earlier this year. Uh, it's available at phyloregnum.org. <laughs> and um, it's got, like I said, just under 300 clay definitions that are publicly accessible right now. Our plan is to convert them into phylo references and additionally publish them as an ontology. Cool. So yeah, that's that's like an um, independent effort that ends up sort of overlapping a little bit with phylo ref. So our, our goal was to provide the tooling to handle clay definition. Right. So it, it doesn't overlap, you know, they're, what they're working on is, is databasing those clay definitions. And then we can um, use that to check our tools and make sure they work. All right, looks good. And uh, yeah, I think we're, we, may, we should go to the next talk. We can uh, have more questions for Gaurav after. I'll, I'll be in the panel, so happy to answer stuff yeah. then. We'll keep a fast pace for the presentations and then yeah. have more time at the end. All right, so Alex. Yes, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so here's the topic we're going to talk on today. My colleagues and I uh, looked at a little case study for automated validation of biological names in environmental survey and impact assessments. Uh, uh, sorry. So um, there's the abstract. You can read that online. But uh, really, the uh, the genesis of this uh, uh, little case study was uh, the publication of uh, GN Finder. Uh, hi, Dimitri. And uh, uh, the we wanted to look at how effective that tool was, uh, pulling names out of uh, the Global Names Index. And what else we, what other attributes for tax on names we could add to that. And uh, the ideal source for us at the time was uh, a, a set of uh, openly accessible uh, ecological assessments that's been published uh, in Western Australia and there's, there's some 700 available. So we thought we'd uh, do a very small test. It's disclaimer, it's not, uh, it's not uh, um, verifiable. It's, you know, not just statistically uh, valid what I'm, the numbers I'm going to present. Uh, Western Australia, you know, it's quite a large place. I hope uh, some of you were here in Perth for the Tadwig conference in 2008. Uh, it's large, 2.5 million square K. And uh, these slides are really just to represent that it's a third of the continent. Uh, it has uh, major conservation areas, the tropical Kimberley, the Southwest Province is one of the 34 biodiversity hotspots in the world. And the arid zone is a very stable, ancient geological area with many unique ecosystems. It's also uh, very valuable for the mineral deposits in those areas. So there's some uh, interesting contention uh, of four land use in uh, throughout Western Australia. And uh, what we thought we'd do is look at uh, IBSA, the Inter Index of Biodiversity Surveys for Assessments. Uh, and it's trying to make available all of those survey reports for use. Survey reports from mining companies, from environmental consultants, make them accessible uh, for further analysis. So that was our data source. Um, Gaia Resources, who we work for, uh, had a role in building the uh, submissions portal for IBSA. 
uh, a couple of years ago. So if you can see that, you know, the people wanting to present a report that's been released uh, enters a data package. So there's some mandatory uh, schema requirements for the data presentation. Uh, and that data package is reviewed by the environmental officers uh, and then submitted into IBS for, for inclusion into IBS and then it becomes available. And on the right, you can see a sample of what's available in IBSA uh, currently. So we took one of those generally at random. And uh, here's what we aim to do, you know, um, use existing data repositories to summarize and report on key issues in each survey report. Uh, currently that takes uh, probably a day's work for a, a large report. We, uh, so we want to extract text, extract taxon names within that text uh, and retrieve attribute data for each name, such as conservation status, whether the name's accepted, does it have subordinate taxa, are the IDs incomplete? So uh, the tools we used were uh, AWS Textract for image-based files, PDF Miner for text, and uh, GN Finder for names resolution. And then we, uh, through the names that were found from uh, the Global Names Index at the national species list that are available via the Atlas of Living Australia AL, uh, APIs. On the right, you can zoom in and see some of the reports from our test page on Species Informer. Very much a work in progress. So here's the high level architecture for what we were doing. Take the source data, convert it into text, store all the information with a job number so uh, there's a single point of reference for each of the components that we're finding for that survey report. Put it through Gen Finder, uh, store the results from Global Name Index, then throw those names at the ALA uh, Biodiversity Engine and uh, download a CSV or an even more compact survey report for the end user. Um, here's the results. So um, in our original 58 page document, and we only tested the one document fully, uh, there were 142 taxon names mentioned. Uh, we found via Species Informer, which is the name of our little uh, test unit software, uh, we found 89% of those names uh, via GenFinder and the Global Names Index. Uh, and not all of those names were completely resolved. So when you took the unresolved names out, it came down to 79%. Uh, and the other image, the other path where we're using uh, image text extraction uh, gave a lesser, uh, a, a lesser result again. This is understandable, it's due to, I would say, the resolution of the original images. Uh, and uh, so that's just the retrieval of taxon names in a report. Um, what we then wanted to do was throw those names that were found at a, a source for attribute data and the results for this document were that uh, in the original document, there were 73 conservation taxa specifically mentioned. We, we actually found 75 taxa when we threw uh, the names at uh, the Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, that's because it finds all the text in a document and sometimes the, the ancillary taxa are mentioned. You know, they're not actually the subject of the report, but they're mentioned somewhere in the notes or in the references. And uh, again, uh, when we threw the names to the ALA, we retrieved about 60% of the conservation status tax that we knew were uh, relevant to the tax in the paper. There's a graph again showing the same data. Um, so some of the issues we found uh, in the survey document, you know, not all the names were well formed, for example, uh, it mentioned Astribla elimoides, but contracted it to A elimoides, not found. Uh, sometimes there are Eastern states, you know, non what WA tax are mentioned, so they're not going to be reportable for Western Australia. And uh, incomplete IDs, by which I mean, they've uttered the species name, but we know that actually one, two or three subspecies exist uh, in, for that taxon. 
often they're conservation taxes, but the actual species level name is not. So that's, uh, that's significant, I think. Um, issues from the GNI uh, Global Name Index Master List, uh, it doesn't score uh, name hybrids, for example. It doesn't know about phrase names. Phrase names are very important here in Western Australia because, uh, well, I present the figures later, but we track a lot of conservation taxa. They're not published. We need an, a handle to manage them with. So we utter phrase names and these are uh, uttered under a national, nationally agreed uh, formula. That's so I don't sound. So if there's a question mark between the genus and the species name, uh, it won't be found even though it might exist. Although, if the question name is in front of a genus, then the string is perfectly valid and is found. Uh, some other issues, uh, of Alex, course, it finds all the text on names. Sorry, Alex, you've How got much? two minutes left. Thank you very much. Uh, this process finds all, all ranks of name that are available on GNI. Uh, it sometimes misinterprets uh, geological names and place names. So, um, discussion and conclusion. Gen Finder really speeds up the process of finding tax on names uttered in a document, but it finds, as mentioned, all the tax on names, not just the relevant ones. Gen Finder has a lot of options we didn't explore, so this is very simply uh, uh, applied. Um, so, Species Informer produces a CSV report in about a minute for a 58 page document. As, as perhaps uh, eight hours for manual verification of the names. However, at a 90% success rate, which sounds good, the environmental officers are still going to check them. So we need a process for allowing people to see what has been missed somehow. Here's the statistics for phrase names. 7% uh, of all tax, native tax in Western Australia have phrase names. Uh, and 15% of the conservation taxes. So it would be really great if they were in the global names index is my point. And in conclusion, data governance at all parts of the process are really important, making sure the source report, uh, all the tax are uh, uttered with resolved names, fully resolved names, uh, all authoritative tax on names would ideally be in the global name index. And in terms of retrieving a tribute data like names, currency and conservation status, those things are changing on a daily basis across Australia. And it would be great if the, name, the species names list available in the ALA were maintained at a similar pace. Uh, here's a set of references you can look at for the, thing, the tools and sites I've mentioned. And I uh, would like to say thank you to the people who provided the software and the source data for the project. And thank you for listening. All right, awesome. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so I see a question from Rich Pyle in the chat window. Can't phrase names be discovered by just the genus part, at least as a start? And same for the hybrids, he says. Uh, well, uh, not via the process we were using. It would, uh, it would only find the genus name and, and wouldn't list the, the subordinate levels. Rich, did you want to jump in there if you can do audio and expand on that at all? Sure. Um, so basically, though, wouldn't it at least flag where within the document a genus name existed so you wouldn't have to spend eight hours pulling over all 50 ah. pages? You could, you could at least you know, narrow down your search for, for candidate names that weren't picked up as an entire, entire name. You're right. You're right. And uh, really, uh, what we're doing is really replicating a lot of the functionality that the Biodiversity Heritage Library is doing. And one point I didn't mention in my, in my presentation was maybe we just need to put all uh, authenticated uh, environmental impact uh, reports into the Biodiversity Heritage Library and use the existing tool set. That's, that's an alternative entirely. I think there's some merit in that idea. Okay. Anyone from BHL here? <laughs> We can definitely pick up that topic in the in the main discussion. I, yeah, that's a good call to try and interface with with BHL. Um, mm -hmm. We need to. So the the next talk is um, from the Nature Serve, Anne Francis and Leah Oliver, and uh, we're playing it by video. Is it, can everybody see this?
Yep. Yep. I'm the lead botanist with NatureServe, and I am presenting with my colleagues, Leah Oliver and Kathy Gooden. I'll be speaking about the conservation implications of taxonomy using a use case of Trillium. So NatureServe is an environmental nonprofit um, we focus on conservation and we help to coordinate a network of about 80 programs um, throughout the Americas. Because of our mission of conservation, we collect, maintain, and disseminate high quality data um, with a particular focus on rare and imperiled species and ecosystems. So you may know us for our conservation status assessments or ranks. These assessments provide a relative risk of extinction using a numerical scale from one to five, one being the most imperiled and five being the least imperiled. We also do this at three geographic scales using letter prefixes to indicate G for global, N for national, or S for subnational. Um, if you're more familiar with the red list, our ranks are very similar. This is a crosswalk of how our ranks align with the red list categories. So as I mentioned, we have these conservation status ranks. Um, and this is a screenshot of our public facing website called Nature Surf Explorer. And it is showing Trillium Puslum. You can see here that it is globally ranked G3 or vulnerable but that its status at the state level varies considerably. In the red, you see um, states that have, that consider it critically imperiled or S1, orange, imperiled or S2, yellow, vulnerable or S3, and these two have not assigned a rank yet. So we use these nested status ranks to provide uh, more complete information about how um, imperiled species are and where they might need protection. And so these status ranks are maintained um, differently depending on the geographic scale. So the global and um, national level are uh, maintained by NatureServe, um, but the subnational or state data, including all the downstream spatial data called element occurrences, uh, are maintained by the individual programs. So in order to aggregate all of this data, we have a data exchange process where information from our central biotics is pushed out to um, member program databases and we receive their data in return. But underpinning all of this is the need for taxonomic reconciliation. Otherwise, we will make mistakes with our data aggregation and we won't be comparing apples to apples. We do have a shared data model um, in our network. Um, and again, what underpins that shared data model is the taxonomic framework. So NatureServe Central maintains the taxonomy for the entire network. Uh, the taxonomy in our database, which is called Biotics, is concept-based, where every element has one circumscription or concept that distinguishes it from another, regardless of the name. And we know that name is not enough to distinguish among concepts. These are two examples that I like to use. One concept can have many names, as in the case of Lady Gaga, and one name can represent many concepts, as in the case of Madonna. Uh, when we were developing the Natural Heritage Network um, and the database uh, to maintain all of this conservation information, there weren't a lot of conventions around to guide us. So we made up our own. Um, we basically have three categories of classification status, standards, non-standards, and provisionals. We need to maintain a standard list of names um, in order to align data from all of our programs um, and for all of our species and ecosystems, but most importantly, to provide information that makes sense or is intelligent for our users and our stakeholders. We can't expect users to sort through the mishmash of different taxonomic concepts and know what to do with them. At the same time, we need to have a way to maintain uh, concepts that are not accepted by the standard for various reasons. There can be legal status attached to what we call a non-standard um, or a need for a program to maintain that separately. So we do. We also have provisionals, which are elements that have been published, but we haven't had a chance to formally address. So getting back to our Trillium pusillum use case, um, Trillium pusillum is a beautiful spring wildflower in the Eastern US. 
in one of the most broad treatments for North America, only one species is recognized with two varieties. Um, and the species and the varieties are all considered vulnerable or G3 or T3. Now we're gonna to switch to the most split treatment, which is Susan Farmer's dissertation. She recognizes 10 distinct species and here they all are color coded by their county distributions. So what are you supposed to do if you're a conservation organization that needs to attach conservation status ranks and downstream data? Well, the first thing is to align all of the different um, concepts of the relevant treatments in this diagram um, produced by Nico Franz shows the relationships um, all the way from the broad treatment of flora of North America um, to farmers and then a depiction of what NatureServe is currently accepting. In the current NatureServe treatment, we accept three species, Georgiana, which is this little bit of gold right here, which is globally critically imperiled, Texanum, which is in the um, orange here, globally imperiled, um, and then the rest of it is still in Pusillum. However, we recognize four varieties, Monticulum, which is the dark blue, globally critically imperiled, Ozarcanum, which is the dark green, uh, with the unpublished Alabamicum here, what's left of Pusillum in the light green with the unpublished Patricii, and then variety Virginianum, which is the blue with the unpublished Palestris and Carolinianum. So the point that I really want to drive home is that the different concepts that we follow result in different conservation ranks. And this is absolutely important if you are a land manager trying to figure out what to do with the species on your lands. So when we look at the Florida North America treatment, there are no imperil taxa at all. But the current nature surf treatment has three imperil taxa, Georgianum, Texanum, and variety Monticulum. So in summary, I wanted to mention that um, NatureServe maintains the taxonomic framework for a network of programs um, because we have to, to maintain our conservation um, statuses and data. We need a concept-based system to do it. Um, we have to reconcile taxonomy in order to do data exchange and to include all of that downstream spatial and conservation data with it. It's a very time-consuming and mostly manual process um, and we would absolutely benefit by having um, more widely accepted standards on how to do this and having efficient technology. Um, and my final take home point is that taxonomy really does impact the conservation that's happening on all of our watches. So together as a community by improving the processes and standards we have for reconciling taxonomy, the better we will do at conservation overall. Thank you. All right, and so Anne and Leah uh, are here uh, in the Zoom call, so we can do questions there. Um, and again, you can uh, go hand or uh, drop it in the chat window. Yeah, and we've got a couple minutes. Very cool to see the the Trillium use case starting to come together, and. Yeah, so if there are mistakes, they're my fault. Um, but if you like how it looks, it's um, Nico's. Um, kudos to Nico. <laughs> well, one quick question I had, um, as if anyone's typing in the meantime, um, to what extent do the state programs share data between each other? Does that all happen up through NatureServe and then back and they're kind of collecting data from, from other programs or are they directly exchanging data as well without going through the biotics database. Leah, do you, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer and Leah can add on if she wants. So um, it's, a, it's actually a really good question. Be, uh, several years ago, before we upgraded to our new database, programs had uh, more ability or capability to share data directly uh, amongst themselves. But with our new database structure, um, they're not able to, they would, uh, it, it, it's the permissions are up to each state or province how they want to do it. So if they want to give another state or province um, access to their database, they can, but there's not a um, kind of institutional like protocol or easy way to do it. There, there's a question from Cam Webb 
um, what software tools for manual taxon concept mapping are you using now? So we have um, in our in our network um, most of the programs use the same database um, structure that we do in software at, uh, in biotics, and we're basically developing custom tools to exchange data um, within our own database. Um, and so, but the, for the programs that are not in biotics, um, it's, uh, thank you, Beckett. It's a, it's a manual, Leah, how do you explain exchanger? Yeah, it was another custom built tool for our former platform, but it's very clunky and time consuming. Maybe we can, in the discussion, we can talk about that more and how yeah. we can maybe scale that. Um, I think we need to move on to Atria. Thanks, Ann and Leah. <clears throat> Atria, I think you're still muted. Sorry about that. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is uh, Atria Sen, and I'm a postdoc at uh, Arizona State University. Um, and I'm going to talk about, so I'm just sharing my screen right now. So I'm going to be talking about a uh, web-based software that uh, is under de de development called um, ATCRL. So it's called the Automated Taxonomic Concept uh, Reasoner and Learner. And uh, this is a, it's a visual interactive uh, taxonomic AI tool which uh, it, it builds upon a previous version of uh, a similar tool called Euler X, which was command line based. Um, <clears throat> you can see a publication from uh, 2004 on Euler X. Uh, this is a version which is, uh, which is in the web, uh, accessible both in the browser and via an API. And the idea here is that uh, we'd, we'd, we use AI and in particular automated reasoning to find alignments by, by deductive reasoning of multiple taxonomies um, according to articulations or relationships between the taxonomies that are provided by the users of the system. Um, and we, we do this by uh, reducing the alignment problem to logical inference in a decidable fragment of first order logic, and then efficiently solving this problem using uh, an, an SMT solver uh, by by Microsoft, so the Microsoft Z3 SMT solver. So on the on the right side of the screen, uh, you can see uh, a screenshot uh, from this tool. And in the screen in the screenshot, you see uh, two taxonomies: uh, taxonomy A and taxonomy B, um, colored uh, blue and uh, green, uh, respectively. I think. And then you see these gray arrows, which are the taxonomic relationships between the concepts in the taxonomies. And you also see the green arrows, which are uh, articulations provided by the user of the taxonomy. So these articulations can be of five kinds. And uh, these five kinds are, are represented by the, uh, the, the calculus known in the AI community as RCC5. So five types of articulations, inclusion, exclusion, equality, disjointness and overlap between concepts of these two taxonomies. So each of these um, symbols you see in the curly brackets are one of these five kinds of relationships. Um, and so the ones in, in green are provided by the user and then you have the, the mustard colored relationships, uh, which are the, the relationships deduced automatically by the reasoner. And the reasoner can also handle uncertainty in the form that if, if the exact RCC5 relationship between two concepts cannot be deduced or doesn't follow from the taxonomies and relationships provided, it can, it can state that uncertainty and, and present the deduced uh, articulation as a disjunction of, uh, of several RCC5 articulations. So the, the, this automated reasoning is one component of the software. The other, the other research problem is, uh, is it possible to use machine learning and in particular machine learning from biodiversity data, such as images, DNA, uh, trait maps, and so on and so forth to guide this alignment. And in particular, 
to to automatically obtain uh, these uh, these articulations, which currently can only be provided by the users of of the tool. So we've been doing some work on that, and in particular, we've been doing for images and in, more specifically for herbarium images. Uh, we've been using uh, deep convolutional neural networks to learn an internal representation of the images and then associate uh, these images with the taxonomies in an effort to learn these uh, these articulations auto automatically. And it's, it's a difficult machine learning problem because uh, obviously morphological features are often small, fine-grained features um, in the images, and uh, it's 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 a known difficult machine learning problem to to learn uh, very small, uh, not well differentiated uh, morph Im Im features from from these images. Uh, the EulerX tool, however, has already been used, uh, and you see a paper in the bottom right corner of the screen uh, by Nico and his colleagues uh, to align. In, in several papers aligning many different taxonomies, this this is just one of them. Um, so I'm I'm going to give you a um, a, a live uh, demonstration of this tool in action. The the the, the reasoning component, uh, because the machine learning component we're still working on. So you should be able to see. Let's see. So you should be able to see a browser window right now. So this is the uh, this is the tool uh, in, uh, in 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 the browser running on Heroku, and uh, all you have to do is uh, you, you need to uh, load an input file which is specified in a in a particular format. Specifies both the two taxonomies you want to align and the relationships uh, provided between the two taxonomies. And then you get this uh, interface where you can choose the the articulations in in this uh, list of checkboxes you see above the uh, above the display, and as you choose the the articulations which you want to provide to the reasoner, the reason the reasoner will dynamic di dynamically and automatically align the taxonomies uh, according to these articulations and uh, and show you the results uh, in in the browser. So you can see that uh, as I'm changing the um, the selections in the text boxes, the the alignments are are also will also be changing. And you can also drag and uh, move around these boxes so that you can visually sort of arrange the taxonomies uh, in in the way that you you concept conceptually see them. Um, so all right, so that's that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, and so I see that uh, Rich Pyle has a question in the chat. And so I think, Achia, if you pull up the earlier slide that you had um, with the first alignment, that's probably what he was referring to. And so he's asking about, um, it looks like A1 and B1 are equal and also A1 and B2 are equal. And so um, I think he was confused about what was going on there. Um, right, let, let me just reshare my screen because I think I stopped sharing it. Uh, can you can you see the slide here? Yeah. Right. Uh, so I think the issue here is that um, there are a couple of constraints, uh, global constraints that we are applying um, to to the logic in addition to the uh, to the taxonomies and the user provided articulations. And in in particular, there are three constraints. So one of them is coverage, uh, sibling disjointness, and non-emptiness. So non-emptiness just says that uh, if you have a species concept, there is at, at least one instance of that concept. So you, you can't have an empty species concept. concept. And then sibling disjointness says that uh, the, the, the siblings, so sib shared uh, concepts with have the shared, same shared parent uh, don't have uh, species in common. And then coverage means that all of the species concepts in a parent concepts in a parent concept are covered by the children of that parent. So we're, we're applying all three of these constraints uh, in addition to to the uh, to to the to the articulations that you see on the screen here, and uh, and that obviously uh, it it affects the the results of the reasoning because the the the, the articulations are constrained. 
uh, by these constraints. Does, uh, does that answer your question? Rich said, okay, thanks in the chat. So that sounds good. Okay. All right, well, shall we keep moving then to the next presentation? Yeah, next up we have Nico, Nico Franz, take it away. And make sure to unmute Nico. Yeah, yeah, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes? Yep, all good. Yes. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so thanks for uh, sticking around. Uh, trading zone here is a metaphor for creating a series of pragmatic rules uh, to coordinate interests, exchange information across communities that might otherwise uh, subscribe to difficult to reconcile views and practices. And so this is uh, a bit of a reference to a, a fairly recent um, set of articles and happenings related to the relationship between systematics and conservation. And I thought that these authors summed it up pretty well when they said uh, taxonomists and conservation biologists should join forces to promote effective legislative mechanisms to deal with a changing taxonomy rather than engaging in fighting about how to do taxonomy. And so in some sense, the authors are saying, let's get married. Um, but also we're not paying for the wedding uh, because uh, conservation management uh, does not have a sound way to track taxonomic change because systematics does not either. Uh, and so uh, we are trying to make the case here that uh, out of this conundrum uh, should really come better data science designs uh, and that's the way to go forward. And we're using a microcebus, the so-called uh, Malagasy uh, mouse lemurs as a good use case or stress, ca uh, stress test uh, in order to better understand how to design this envisioned uh, data science trading zone uh, between systematics and conservation. Microcebus are endearing, they're endangered, and they are uh, taxonomically complex. Uh, for about 60 years, these Malagasy mouse lemurs have been separated mainly into a Western gray lineage Murinus, which literally means mouse gray, and a northern and eastern reddish lineage rufus. And so this paradigm of an eastern and a, a, a western uh, separation uh, is well present uh, throughout the 90s and in fact up to uh, very recently uh, the International Union for Conservation and Nature. Uh, basically, I presume added a little bit of niche modeling here, but otherwise has this um, inherited uh, distribution as its paradigm. However, uh, if you are looking at uh, taxonomic progress, especially in the last 20 years, post uh, the 2005 uh, mammal species of the world, uh, third edition, which recognized three valid species level names, now we're up to 25. And uh, so these were overwhelmingly coined in the past uh, 20 years. You can see many of them are uh, variously endangered as well. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, there are conflicting species concepts, conflicting inference methods, uh, intersecting conservation interests that all run pretty wildly through this uh, set of uh, new taxonomic publications, uh, sequentially, incrementally, and in many cases, simultaneously. Um, this is nowadays how IUCN is attempting to reflect on these changes. And the overwhelming notion is that the uh, widespread older taxonomic concepts, especially uh, Rufus uh, along the uh, eastern coast of Madagascar, um, now has a much narrower distribution. Uh, and there's a, a reflection of, of increasingly finer distributed uh, species level concepts. Um, uh, this uh, creates some challenges uh, for IUCN even uh, to keep its own mapping straight. So what you see here is a, sort of like a 2008 notion of Rufus underlying uh, more recent uh, notions where Rufus is actually south of this entire 
distribution. And so if you're looking at uh, succeeding ICN maps, uh, you can have situations of uh, contraction uh, from one version uh, to the next. Uh, so this was Rufus according to 2008 versus 2014. You can also have expansion uh, where the older notion of myoxinus here was actually disjoint and somewhat limited. A younger one uh, is more expans uh, expansive in its distribution. And you can have forms of overlap where uh, you have basically then fossorum or then fossae, which are considered taxonomically congruent, but with uh, variously disjoint and overlapping uh, distributions. Um, so in addition, I'm just going to claim that as a systematist and in the year 2020, where GBIF is gradually going on 2 billion records, uh, I find these range maps just a little goofy. Uh, you know, why can't we go to the occurrence level? Well, uh, that's because uh, sort of the joint collections data are also not really up to snuff. This is a GBIF uh, view. Um, for uh, the Madagascar microceivers, where only 15 out of a potential 25 uh, species names are even mentioned. Uh, some 70 uh, occurrences, 70% 70 of the occurrences are georeferenced, except for probably more than uh, three fourths of them are uh, either non unique, they're redundant, or they just say Madagascar as, as a centroid. Um, and you have uh, a preponderance of the old epithets. Uh, Morinus and Rufus uh, appearing too widespread according to anyone's view in the last 25 years and hence therefore very likely reflecting pre-2000 concepts to which uh, these occurrences were identified. Uh, so this is uh, not particularly uh, useful or encouraging either. Interim conclusion, this is not about taxonomic freedom versus stability in order to uh, do lawmaking. Uh, what you have here is actually a situation uh, of two communities largely talking past each other, not really identifying that the solution to is, this is done on either side. Uh, we have good mechanisms and good practices in place uh, to keep up with internal and then also cross-cutting uh, data dynamics. A lot of this is implementation, and implementation should not be sort of pushed into the into the area of, of design when, when it itself can be um, uh, uh, the cost, but some of it is also design. And we're trying to use this study in order to tease the two a little bit apart and, and make sure that we uh, produce some good re recommendations for future designs. How do we do this? Uh, and here I have to credit uh, my co-author, uh, Kevin Cortez Hernandez. Uh, we are basically going back to the primary literature and we're trying to re-engineer all of the taxonomic views and changes and the impact and implications for uh, specimens along the way. And so uh, a good part of this is using uh, the Euler tool or its uh, successor to come up with these uh, region connection calculus based uh, RCC5 alignments. Um, where you can see you starting out with uh, a relatively coarse taxonomy. This is the old one. And then you can document the relative splitting of the taxonomic concepts as explained sometimes very clearly, sometimes more implicitly in the primary literature. This covers the range from 1993 to 2000. Uh, next step would be, and we've done this initially in chunks of four just for visualization purposes. Uh, you can go from 2000 uh, to 2005, and you can see that there are certain concepts that, that maybe have a provisional name, uh, then are uh, merged again, and then finally become more formalized with proper names, all the way to 2007 and uh, to 2010. This is how far we've gotten so far. And along the way, the second component then is to try to go also into these references and basically reproduce uh, the specimen data that are being identified to these circumscribed concepts in each of the sources, uh, translate them into Davenport uh, occurrences, and understand how the different worlds look at a time and then learn how to transition from them. And so, of course, we do not have such a tool yet, but showing you these transition systems is kind of like a rough 
proto design of the kind of tool capability that you would ultimately want to have. You would want to be able to look at uh, Rasolo Harrison et al, who did a seminal study of the Western lemurs in 2000 and understand how do their occurrences look according to them at a time. Then you will see how many of these occurrences have been reutilized, which identifications have been confirmed or just adopted and which have been added and changed. So you, you want to build a transition tool in which you can actually understand the changes. They're implicit uh, in the literature. We don't really have a tool to make them explicit. And then you will learn, for example, that, okay, so in this case, we just have a taxon added that wasn't focal here, but in some cases you have data points added or not reconsidered that uh, could have been included uh, on the other side. So we have just started with this. This is not a finished study. It's more like a thought piece, if you will. Uh, but you can see the emerging complementarity of uh, occurrences um, that, that somehow is more satisfying if uh, you start out by tying them to the uh, primary, primary literature and, and, and you're keeping that connection between uh, the uh, taxonomic treatment and the identifications in the occurrences separate so that you can then possibly also build a transition system. And um, so this is just from uh, five primary sources here so far that we've looked at uh, a total, sorry, of um, 26 concepts, about 150 unique occurrences. And one of the interesting features is that even though we're not using range maps and even though we're using uh, data that are potentially also in GBIF, the signals uh, start to become clearer in terms of actually being able to discern that there are uh, relatively prevalent patterns of allopatry, even in these relatively densely bunched and closely uh, physically uh, affiliated uh, populations and, and um, putative species uh, lineages. And so the, the pattern is actually cleaning up a little bit. And uh, I think uh, maybe to wrap up like- uh, yeah, yeah, I only have a couple more slides. Thank so. you. Um, you can then also use the tool uh, or at least these kinds of visualizations uh, to understand at what point the very same specimens uh, started to become assigned uh, to a, a separate concept. Okay, so you can visually explore that. Uh, you have uh, three treatments right here, looking at certain um, specimens, they are redundantly listed, uh, but uh, occurrences identified to Morinus in 1989 started being identified to Revolobensis in uh, uh, Zolo Arison in 2000. And so this would be sort of like a, a transition system alert uh, function that you could get. So my conclusions here, uh, data science for the new trading zone, uh, the use of these alignments across treatments, combined with explicit re-identifications of the occurrences to newly published concepts, can inform next generation tools where the impact of the change can be visualized, assessed, can be bound, and therefore in some sense be controlled for. Um, uh, both the alignments uh, and uh, the identifications are potentially amenable to logic-based automation. Um, in terms of the design, uh, you want to build systems that explicitly manage these concepts and that are also uh, explicitly allowing multiple parallel time ranged start date, end date uh, identifications of occurrences to multiple concepts. There is a lot else that you need to push for. You need to push for a culture where people are uh, increasingly confident in making assertions and building on the assertions of uh, taxonomies that they don't themselves uh, endorse and identifications that they might not have themselves favored, right? So there, there's a lot of sort of other directness that also has to happen. Uh, if you provide that as a foot forward into the trading zone, uh, then perhaps on the legislative side, uh, you can deal with that kind of control for change and you can start managing congruent RCC5 type lineages and you might be able to get away from this notion that it's either the biological species concept or the phylogenetic one, or it's either this authority or that authority, which is ultimately not a, a fruitful path to design this trading zone. And that's all I have. Thank you. I want to thank some of the collaborators, the organizers, 
uh, and also Michaela Pacifici and Carlo Rondinini from the Global Mammal Assessment for access to the IUCN range maps. Thanks. All right, so I think um, what I'll do is I'll pick a, a short question from David Shorthouse and then Matt, I see you had a question there, um, but if you can hold on to that, let's bring that back into the discussion because um, I think I'm anticipating that'll take a longer answer. Um, so David is asking in the chat, uh, Tanico, how do you infer what concept was used as the source for the identification of an occurrence record? Well, so uh, we're basically taking them from the papers that they come from, right? And so in, in those papers, they might be in tables, they might be in a, a, a diagnostic um, section, they might be in a specimen section, they might be in a figure. Uh, so that's the, the initial uh, point. Um, then when you go sort of like across, you have to make additional assumptions. And the point of the exercise is to actually make the assumptions transparent, right? But there are various that are going into those. Some of them might be uh, related to um, uh, other uh, uh, remarks that the author has made. Uh, others might be uh, explained by a legacy of practice, uh, and yet others might be explained by sort of inferences about allopatry and so forth. Okay, so, um, so let's shift over to our last talk and then um, we'll open up for the uh, broader panel and discussion. Um, so coming up next is Jonathan Reese. Is that Jonathan Reese, sorry. Um, get you uh, to go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. yep. Okay, good. So um, I wanted to report, th thanks Beckett, um, on a, a program I've been working on. This, this is a work in progress. So it's going to be a bit rough. Uh, this is a standalone uh, sort of batch program um, uh, for, uh, for comparing and integrating taxonomic checklists. So the, 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 and, um, this is all familiar to everyone here. Um, the whole reason for Tadwig is because you, you, you want to bring different so data sources together because they have different kinds of information. They have different coverage. And so it's so. Uh, and in, in, in the biodiversity world, each data source typically has a, its own taxon list and the taxon lists don't match up. Uh, so, so the problem is, is matching this next slide. Uh, so there are a bunch of, of, of scenario integrations. I, I wanna emphasize that this is a, this is a very general problem. Um, sometimes you're getting data from different studies like ecological studies, and you're, you're trying to bring them into some uh, analysis workspace because you're making a new study, which is which is trying to either aggregate or join information across uh, uh, different kinds of information from different studies through the taxon lists. Um, and similarly, you 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 often want to combine study data with some aggregation, like GenBank, if you want to apply sequence information to an ecological study or something like that. Um, uh, anytime you're doing a new taxonomic treatment, you have this problem. And sometimes people are forced into doing taxonomic treatments, even when they're not specialists in the in the, in that group. So this is a, a non-trivial case. And then there are cases associated with aggregations, either adding new data sources or uh, doing comparisons. Next slide, please. Uh, so this so the problem you have comparing uh, taxon lists uh, between two two sources. Um, sometimes you know the names match up and they have the same meaning. In the two in the two da data sets, uh, sometimes you have simple spelling changes that have to be ac uh, accommodated, like uh, through stemming. Um, sometimes a name just changes completely, and uh, you know you may or may, may not be able to to figure that out. Uh, sometimes a new name shows up, and it, it seems to be just de novo. You know that could be a difference in coverage between the two data, data sources, or uh, a, a difference in uh, uh, what in 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 uh, currency or whatever. Sometimes a name, a, a single name refers to two different taxa, like through this, this would be through uh, lumping uh, that, that, uh, that you have two different circumscriptions for the same, same name. And then sometimes you have splits and joins and then lots of other things can happen. This is all familiar. Next slide, please. Um, so this process of reconciling uh, uh, 
two, two taxon lists. The output of reconciling is, is I'm calling that an alignment af after uh, Nico and I guess other people have used that word. So it's just a correspondence between, between two lists with some relationship. And I'm assuming sort of the, the RCC5 relationships, but they could be other kinds of, of relationships, anything that can be used by whoever is doing the ag aggregating. Next slide. So align. So so I'm. The, the point here is that alignments themselves are interesting artifacts. Um, they can be very difficult to produce, very labor intensive. As we know, you you know you can spend hours doing literature research and scrutinizing the, the context of each study to figure out what exactly is meant by any given name. So uh, so so since this is any this is difficult. So so this is a a great place to do tooling. Um, um, and now I'm not saying the whole thing can be automated because to do that, you have to have access and understanding of all the taxonomic literature and all of the other data in the data sets. But um, I'm proposing a sort of cycle where some things can be uh, automated and some can be, some steps can't be. So you're gonna have a, uh, hang on. I didn't check the time. How many minutes left do I have? Nate, timekeeper. Sorry about that. Yeah, you've, you've got about uh, six minutes. Okay, good. So, um, so the tool can take the two checklists and it can propose relationships based on uh, based on the names and any other information that it has available. Um, hierarchy information, uh, heuristics, um, um, uh, you, you know, identifiers, anything like that. So. So the, you, 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 want, you want the tool to make the best use of whatever information it has. And the output of that is to propose an alignment. Um, you wanna report on the alignment of bringing attention to particular problem spots. Um, that, that Generating that report can be automatic, but we know that an automatic alignment is typically going to be wrong. Uh, it's, it's because it, you know, the tool just can't know what the right answer is. There's not enough information available. So, uh, so whoever cares about the alignment is, is gonna be looking at parts of it that they care about and they're gonna try to resolve them somehow. Um, they need to decide whether a taxon is wholly new or whether it's a split from some other uh, taxon, that kind of thing. Um, and you should be able to capture the results of, the, of the, any decisions or new information like that. You should be able to capture that, you know, perhaps as a set of uh, hand curated RCC5 relationships or something like that. Uh, and then that can feed in to, 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 to make a new proposed uh, alignment. Um, there's a lot more to this, so this sort of ecosystem. This, this can fit in with visualization tools, with uh, reasoning tools of the sort a, a, a trio was talking about, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. So uh, so this, the, this is the tool that I've, I've been prototyping. Um, uh, so, so the, the, this is an example proposal. If one list has, has these three taxa, the, the other one has four, one of the four is, it appears to be new and you can assume, you, the, the tool is just gonna say, well, let's just assume that there, there's stuff that wasn't covered by the first taxon list. So that the new, uh, the new taxon U is disjoint from X, Y, and W and the others match. That's a really simple case. Uh, so next slide. So uh, a person looks at that and says, "Wait a minute, this you know this is birds. We we already know all about birds. We, we we don't we're not discovering new birds in the wild here. So you must be uh, must must cover specimens that we already know about. Uh, and in fact, a, a, a look at the literature or at the data they, they both have information that bears on this um, can show that um, you have." Um, um, uh, a split where the name W now means in the in the B list means a, a smaller taxon than it did in the A list. Um, so that's that that's that's what I mean by resolution, uh, and then that that can lead to to this updated proposal. Next slide, please. Um, so the the this tool takes uh, two two lists in, and it takes this advice this the, these these captured resolutions. In and the output are uh, the outputs are things like um, the proposed alignment that can be kind of hard to read and manage, especially for large uh, lists. Um, a merged hierarchy is is very helpful. Uh, 
that has to throw out certain relationships in order to uh, get a hierarchy. You want to throw out uh, relationships that make it inconsistent or non-hierarchical. Um, a summary report is is very useful, and then the issues list. Um, so uh, the issues list is just things that it discovered in analyzing the two lists together that a human uh, curator ought, or, or someone ought to look at. Next slide, please. Um, this I'm sort of repeating what I what I'm saying, but but there's there's um, uh, there's a whole lot of things that can be automated here. These are all things obviously you can do manually, but this, this these are just you want the tool to do sort of as much as as it can. I mentioned stemming before, um, dealing with misspellings perhaps. Uh, you know a lot of this is covered by by tools we're familiar with. Um, Moving things from one genus to another, uh, a change of rank, uh, dealing with identifiers. Uh, there's increasing information about type material coming out that that can be very useful, um, and uh, dealing with uh, ambiguities in in names. Um, the you can do hierarchy analysis with uh, RCC five relationships, um, and then other stuff. Next slide, please. Okay. That's probably very hard to see. I can't see it, um, but this is just just to give you a, a, a flavor of what the thing looks like right now. It's the this is the merged hierarchy, um, but it's listing all of the all of the taxon concepts or taxa th that are in either of the two checklists, and so each row is tax taxon concept. You have columns for the names that it has in whichever checklist it occurs in. To sometimes both, or sometimes one or the other, and then and then there's information about how how things uh, compare. So this is showing that uh, um, Chromo. Sorry, Jonathan. I think we should wrap up. Uh, we, we should wrap up. Okay. So this is showing that it detected an inconsistency. That's line one ninety four. Next slide. And this is showing us a, a split, a genus split, which which was discovered. So again, it's not doing name matching for the genus because it's discovered that the the, that the genus in the, of that name in the two checklists are actually have different memberships. Um, there's a lot more I could show. Uh, there's a split. Uh, there's there's a species level split that it dis discovered. Um, a lot. It can do a lot with synonyms and and things like changes. There's a lot that happens when subspecies are added and removed, or a group is promoted or demoted from a, between a subspecies and a subspecies. Those are big keys that um, you have you have taxon concept changes for a particular name, uh, and uh, that's that's it. Uh, you may have noticed this follows on from work I did uh, on Open Tree of Life, um, and. I've gotten a lot of benefit from working with EOL and the folks in Arizona. And uh, uh, that's it. All right, a um, uh, quick question for Jonathan there. Sorry, I wasn't able to track chat uh, while I was doing the slides. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, any questions for Jonathan before we go to the, the broader group? We, we can always circle back. Um, I think we want to kind of formally welcome, we have a few additional panelists. Um, Katja Scholz, Cam Webb, Johan Lilliblad, Anne Fuchs, and Jeff Gerbrock. I'm not sure, am I, is everybody here? I think so. Yeah. Cool. You even got got Johan in the middle of the night in Sweden. Cool. So maybe to get us started, then, um, if we could go to, to you guys uh, that that Nate just named, and if there were things of particular interest, um, you know, themes or questions that you wanted to raise to help uh, get us the broader discussion going. Um, why don't you uh, go ahead and, and jump in here and uh, get us started. 
I, I can I can get started. Uh, I'm Katja Schultz. I work with the Encyclopedia of Life, um, and our needs for um, taxonomic information are are very broad um, and don't entirely align with with all of the use cases that we've seen so far. Um, so what what we've been looking for for a long time is trying to find um, somebody that can help us with an internally consistent hierarchy um, that is still dynamically updated um, as comprehensive as possible, uh, includes uh, mechanisms for quality control, um, is based on phylogenetics as much as possible, but still easy to navigate. Um, those are all priorities that we have, which I understand is very specific to our use case, which is um, helping non-specialist users navigate and query data. Most of the data that we, that we care mostly about are trait data that we attach to the tree of life very broadly from um, proteins to mammals to birds and so on. Um, and we've really been struggling of finding the right tools um, and finding the right checklist that we can plug in um, and leverage on our site. And I haven't really seen all that much today that gives me huge hope, except for the, for the work that Jonathan just presented that we've already have a stake in. But the, the, other, the other things that I've seen today, great, but I don't see how they can, can uh, scale up, especially since we've been talking about them for, you know, like five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see if, if there's, there's more that I just don't get yet. I, I can suggest a, a potential way that they can scale. And it's sort of what we've been working towards in our ASU group, um, which is that something like Jonathan's tool you know, initially on, on large checklists can create RCC5 articulations, which can then feed into a TRIA's tool for sort of understanding in greater detail what those, um, what the nuance of those uh, RCC5 are, sort of for curating it and, and looking at them. Um, and then sort of if you, if you could couple that with geographic range map type uh, insights like like Nico's been digging into with the microcebus example, um, you'd be able to start teasing apart, you know, kind of the spatial nature of those taxonomic concepts, and then you could use that to reassign GBIF occurrence data points and and sort of update museum specimen records, um, and then and the traits associated with those museum specimens. So that's sort of like the big picture of where we're trying to go with this. We're not there yet. You're, you're definitely right. And I think it's interesting um, to, you know, I the the way that we've been phrasing this uh, in recent months has been talking about mosaic progress, right? So maybe mammals are a scale at which we can make progress here, um, but not yet everything. And so, is there a path from mosaics towards something that could work for EO, uh, EOL? Um, I don't know, but maybe an interesting discussion topic there. You know, how do we scale up some of the things we've seen um, to you know the level of the larger taxonomic groups? I'll, <clears throat> I'll chip in for a second. I, um, my, yeah, this is Cam Webb um, in Alaska, and we, we, we're working on a project uh, for a new flora of Alaska. And part of what we're doing is trying to scale up. Um, uh, using human resources rather than machine resources. So, uh, you know, as we've seen in various cases, a lot of this alignment has to be done, so far has to be done by hand. Um, and one of the questions is, is can non-taxonomists do this? And we are working with a wonderful assistant right now and she's, um, uh, she's, she's not a specialist taxonomist, but she's working through the alignments between five floras uh, and, and the, the, the name that we're going to use or the concept that we're going to use for the new uh, flora. So some, some human scaling up, I think, is possible. Um, but this larger question of machine scaling up um, is, is obviously, we're all wondering about this. I, I, another thing that kind of came up in the chat a little bit, um, 
is is the question of um, maybe we can use the dates of determinations as a as um, a, a tool for making inferences about the taxon concept that was used, even if even if a particular specimen wasn't um, associated with a um, with a sec uh, with a particular taxon concept. So I, I think there's some progress there um, in certain circumstances, but then we have to have to have a pretty good map of the social use of different taxonomic resources among the taxonomic community going back over 100 years. And that's a whole different question, but it might, it might be possible. Yeah, I can just comment. This is Jeff Gerber. I can just comment briefly on, on what Cam just ended with there. Um, you know, a lot of the traits data or, or data that we have are were generated from various field guides over the years which have different concepts and different names through time and often um, might have multiple names, multiple concepts for the same name, even at the same time. Um, so there's a lot of history there that's very, very difficult to unentangle. Um, and the key really is um, that other folks have mentioned as well is really having that name according to in the data sets that we're trying to aggregate you know, that Katja is trying to aggregate or that GBIF is trying to aggregate. So we have a much better chance of, of um, accurately aggregating these data sets so they can be used um, and not, not unintentionally misused. Um, that makes and sense. I, I would also add there on the theme of coordination, you know, I think the, the TRIA's work has really benefited from the museum digitized specimens that are curated uh, you know, to a coherent usage. And so to the extent that we have small to medium sized data sets that are coherent and, and well annotated, that is something that the, you know, computers can then learn from and, and start to scale for us. So I think um, that's another avenue for potentially uh, leveraging the, the smaller level, like what the human, like people can do on a smaller level, right? Uh, and start to move it upward. Um, anyone else from the panel want to jump in there and, and take us to a new theme or question or comment on, on what we've been discussing on before? And then uh, for everyone else, um, uh, same as before, go ahead and raise your hand and participate in the participants window, or we can keep track of chat too for discussion. Johan, could I ask how you guys are, are dealing with, with this in, uh, in your database there in, in, in Sweden? Well, we, we have a, a basically a concept-based database from scratch. Uh, and then we just attach names and with references. So it's a yeah, sec explanation that way. Uh, Problem is that we're in our own little bubble, so all the information we put in needs to be. I mean, if we're exporting to GBIF, it's difficult for GBIF to automatically interpret what we mean, even though it's the information is there. I think it's a um, it, it's a manual process still. So eventually, you would, if GVIF can manage stable identifiers for taxa, I think we could put in a lot of work to actually check that these matchings are correct, but not before that is sort of in there in the systems. So we can start building a list of that things are actually the same, not just uh, Currently, the we are doing a Darwin export to JBIF, but who knows if they are correctly interpreted? Just name matchings, probably. So I think in the coming years we'll see potential if this extended catalog of life manages to have stable taxon identifiers. And that also makes me think of some of the questions that Anne and, and Leah were raising there in terms of standards. Um, it sounds like it would help if there were 
uh, a relevant standard there for how to serve up the uh, usages that you've been collecting in the database. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, I think it's promising. Uh, with the, I've seen the uh, work with the Catalog of Life Plus project. They've included a lot of uh, possibilities to to convey your information from your our national checklist into GBIF for um, Catalog of Life, but it just needs to be um, yeah finalized, I think. But there is a lot of potential to be automatically interpreted, I think now, or at least. Uh, documented properly with usages that this is a, a, a misuse or misapplication of a name and, and so forth. The, uh, are you, if you're still around, I'm wondering if this is a good opportunity to, to discuss the, the biotic software that you guys have and whether that has the potential to be scaled. I, I don't know if biotics can be scaled. Um, it is pretty customized for our network. Um, there has been discussion about um, coming up with something that's more generic. Um, but essentially the way that biotics is structured is similar to um, what other folks who have taxon based databases. Um, so our database holds the plants, vascular plants, non-vascular plants, and all of the mammals um, and some invertebrates, not all of the groups for North America, all related to concepts. And then there's some differences between our botanical data. We tend to maintain a lot more taxonomic concepts um, than um, the zoologist. But one big confounding problem that we have faced is that, and it's been a topic that other people have echoed, is sharing data from our database with others. Even though ours is concept-based, um, we don't have an easy way to do that. Um, I think that discovering whether or not biotics is something that could be used by other entities would um, only be discovered if we could share what it looks like and how it operates and sort of expose some of the data model um, and see how that might be, you know, consumed by others. I don't really know any other way to go about that part of it, but um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that gets to some of the uh, questions that the standards uh, name usage standards group is raising about uh, use cases and and how to move forward uh, to develop uh, points of agreement there. Um, I see that Dennis has his hand raised. Uh, Dennis, are you there? Yeah, I am. Go for it. Hi. Um, so for those, some of you know me, <clears throat> I've, I've been uh, developing AV base for the last many years. Um, I think one of the keys, key ways that I've been able to sort of um, sort of interpret and, and organize um, a lot of taxonomic concepts. Um, so there's there's probably over uh, several millions of different taxonomic concepts spread across several uh, hundred databases. And I, I think to me, the key has always been sort of the underlining meaning of these concepts. So even though there's something like 5 million concepts, um, they really boil down to about uh, a percent, one percent of all of that. So there's about 50,000 or so uh, unique taxonomic concepts. And, and so when we're building these um, relationship between uh, different usages, I think um, it, it becomes a lot easier if you can sort of relate that to a uh, uh, underlying concept. And it's a very difficult thing to manage or to describe without actually associating a name with it. Uh, but it, in my head, like the, the underlying concept and the usages and, um, and the names themselves are sort of very three different entities that I, I think, um, they, you know, would sort of um, be a lot better to organize. I don't know to what extent this can be achieved uh, to the extent that I've done in birds with other taxa. I think obviously birds are 
very unique in a way that they're very well known, very um, like prevalent in, um, in, in our knowledge of, of what, um, how we can organize them. But uh, once you have all of that information, the types of relationship that Jonathan was describing about how you can automate these processes um, so you can make inference, like if you know that you have a list of all North American birds and you can compare taxa, you can see that you have uh, three names and they correspond to a specific uh, sort of type of usage. You can actually sort of look at relationship between names when you build the list to ingest to sort of say, uh, okay, this is the meaning that it actually relates to, you know, these usages uh, that um, underlying. So I, I think the, the really the key there is, is really to build the data and um, having sort of a, a good understanding, a thorough understanding of the underlying concepts and the relationships. And then once you have that, then if you could sort of couple that with sort of distribution information and um, uh, synonym uh, database, then you can do a lot in terms of uh, automating these processes. Um, Dennis, could, could you talk about like, so it sounds like it's mostly a manual curation that Avibase is doing uh, with the use of geospatial data? Uh, I've done, um, well, now the process is a lot easier. So I, I tend to uh, keep up the sort of taxonomic changes over time and in, in sort of global checklist. Um, so if uh, like one of the checklists like Clements um, is issuing a new version once a year, then I, I, I have tool that I can just new checklist. I can do a bit very similar to what Jonathan was explaining in terms of how um, I could sort of do comparisons um, and then sort of identify things that may be new that I need to look after. Um, so there is a bit of manual processing involved, but a lot of it is also automated. And I've built tools as well that sort of allow me to um, uh, use this this notion of um, uh, taxonomic ranks or, or sort of weights that I can sort of uh, partly automate the calculation. So if I know that, you know, a specific version of a, a group will, will sort of entail three species and subspecies are organized in a certain way, um, I can sort of automate a lot of that process um, in terms of adjusting and sort of saying, okay, there's two tax out, so therefore it probably means this one. And I can, I have a lot of the data to allow that sort of um, processing. Would you, would you say, Denis, that a lot of that is on the extensive data set that you've built up over the years with uh, basically having the relationships of a, a number of different taxa and different uh, taxonomic authorities. Is that yeah. certainly- Yeah, that's the key. The tools. Right. And uh, I, I think that um, the scaling up of, of the kind of tools you're mentioning and having a, a, the scaling up of a repository beyond birds is, is I, mean, I feel like we're pretty close with birds. Um, you know, we still need to scale up tools to get them in the hands of the taxonomists, I think. Um, because right now they're in your hands, right? To yeah, me. that's right. Um, and so that's another area where we're certainly looking at scaling up. But yeah, then, and out automated, and, and I think the things we're discussing with Jeff as well is sort of how do we build tools that allow people to sort of do externally what I'm sort of managing on my own in, in my own right. database is, is how do we sort of make interfaces and ways for people to understand all the relationships and the, but I, I think it's doable. Um, yeah. I yeah, think I that think would so serve too. as a good model for how we could potentially manage other taxa, um, at least those that are well known. Yep. We, uh, we've got a question, or I guess a comment from Alex Chapman that we should. Yes, and I see Abby Benson has her hand up. So we'll, we can go to Alex, I guess, and then to Abby. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, it's, this is obvious to everyone in the room, I imagine, but uh, over here, we've had a lot of conflation between name ID and taxon ID. Uh, and it, it's really important to distinguish them. As we know, taxon ID is a unique identifier for a concept of a name, whereas the name idea is simply the name itself. Uh, but I find a lot of users uh, really conflate those two. So uh, that was just a comment that sort of reinforcing Dennis's point about engaging with users. Okay, uh, Abby. Thanks, yeah, I, and I, I, guess I think this follows along with that, so, I'm wondering how this gets uptaken by people who are not taxonomists. So um, I work for USGS and we integrate together the species of greatest conservation need 
um, from the state wildlife action plans into a national list. So we have to do this work of taxonomic alignment. The state send us a list of species names and we need to integrate that together into a national list. And so we use itis and worms to do that because that's what we're familiar with. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, how it, it kind of feels a little bit niche, this, these ideas and, and how they're being um, implemented here. So I'm just wondering how, I, you know, I'd love to do it a better way. I just am not a taxonomist, so. I see uh, Deb has a hand and then Cab. Um, I think there's a, a adding on to what Abby said out in front of all of this is the question about what do we want to do in the future? So what changes do we need to make so that when people are publishing names, we're not having the same conversation 10 to 100 years from now. So if it's, I don't know who it is, but if it's the publishers that make the changes and all of us care about these names, how do we lobby the publishers or lobby a publisher to make the changes that we think need to be made so that when these names are published, they are unambiguous. And I mean, otherwise, like I said, we're just we're just going to keep doing this, I think. So and then we won't have the best answer for for Abby that we could have. Um, I'm happy to take a stab at that. Um, I think, Deb, you're right. I think there's so many places that need to integrate the um, idea of, of a taxonomic name usage or, or a concept that's underneath that um, and publishers are one of those um, but it's also museums you know people bird banders people gathering um, basically any kind of data out in the field whether it's trait data or whether it's genetic data you know any any data gathered around biodiversity um, needs to be able to tag those data with a taxonomic concept, I'll say, that is unchanging through time. And the names change, the replacement in the taxonomy changes, but you know we have to reach a point where those data can be tied to that unique taxonomic identifier. And it's gonna be a long process and I'm not sure where to start. You know, do we start with something like GBIF? Um, so that Johan and I at eBird and, and other places can begin to, to, to give these aggregators data at that concept ID level. And then it will start to flow out from there to publishers and museums, or do we start with the museums? Um, it's more of a big question for me than, than an answer. I'm not sure, you know, I have no idea where, where we should start. But I do recognize that the job is so big that we can't do it all at once. Yeah. So we kind of need to figure out where to start that. I think, I think there's many of you here that see the system, though. And, and so if we could look at that system and say, where do we need to insert piece or pieces strategically so that mm -hmm. we're not doing this in 10 years? All right. I'm so, somebody else right. is turning. Yeah. Be quiet. yeah. So I think uh, Cam is up next, and then I see Dennis again. Thanks, Joe. Well, it, this is following on from those from this various set of topics, but it just, it's a question for Nico. Um, I like this idea of a marketplace of uh, of, ta of tax on concepts and uh, and kind of juggle it, you know, uh, off communicating with uh, let's say conservation entities um, in a more in a more um, uh, a more subtle way than and, and and offering different tax on concepts and the question is really as since you've been thinking about this and, and come up with this idea of how would you then take this very complicated map of uh, re related taxa uh, tax on concepts for these um, for these lemurs and then take this and present it to to folks uh, and 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 po politicians also and say you know. I, how are you going to communicate that? And I think that relates to this issue of how do we get these ideas more more current. Uh, thank you, Cam, and um, and I think uh, Abby and Debs, your your comments were also very pertinent. I, I think the frank answer is that you know we're in our group we're thinking about strategies. Uh, it is kind of niche, 
uh, or niche uh, and and where to have the best leverage uh, is is a little bit of an open question. Um, th there is this other counterpart where you have some folks who just do it, uh, and and some of them are are here, right? And 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 it, and it kind of works. And um, I'm going to propose that that tends to happen most frequently. Um, where there are open systems. Uh, and so in open systems, you have potentially uh, multiple people uh, sort of realizing their interests and, and also in some cases realizing their interests with regards to uh, you know, different taxonomic perspectives. Uh, you know, so iNaturalist is an example, right? It's a, it's a relatively open system and it would lose users, one presumes, if it top-down dictated uh, just one central taxonomy, uh, right? Ebert is also uh, one of those systems, right? And so um, that I, that might just be a, a, a fleeting observation, um, but um, I think these technologies need to come and and go and need to perfect um, uh, sort of practice and services where people already are in, in, in open systems. And you have some other systems that are very frequently accessed and, and that are sort of very important in our world, but most people interacting with them are not really contributing to the system in a very interactive way. And I think to some extent that affords them uh, to be uh, less um, dynamic with regards to, uh, and less democratic with regards to taxonomy. Uh, Dennis, you're next. Hi. Um, I, I think what I'm, I was going to say overlaps partly with what Nico is talking about. I think to me, there's three ways how you answered this problem um, about how we deal with taxonomic concepts moving forward. I think one is, is sort of um, making sure that tools that probably generate the most data, like iNaturalist, eBird, and other things like that, um, are very well aware and, and sort of um, on top of taxonomies. and. Uh, you know, eBird has a, a large network and iNaturalist as well. I, I'm less familiar with how they deal with these problems. With eBird, I know we're constantly sort of looking for errors in the system that people may misinterpret in taxonomies. And we sort of force, um, you know, we have a lot of data that when someone submits an observation in a place, it may not be present there. It may be present in a, a as a name in the taxonomic version of the concept, but uh, not currently in eBird. So there's a lot of effort going into sort of current constantly creating this. Um, and uh, I think it's it would be too much to ask for everyone who uses names to sort of understand all of this. And there's there's a lot of effort that sort of has to go through the, these sort of uh, public systems that generate a lot of data. I think um, for the more advanced users, like the, the professionals, the researchers, I think uh, asking them to sort of always try to uh, publish the, the authority under which they publish these names, I think is, is probably something reasonable. So when the a journal sort of publishes a name, then I think, you know, there might be a standard by which we sort of encourage all researchers to always sort of be explicit about what they mean. Um, and they often do it, but maybe having better ways to do it, um, there are probably better ways to do it. And I, I think the third piece that is really important is sort of systems that allow you to res resolve these uh, authorities among each other. So when someone sort of gives you uh, a name according to something, um, you can sort of translate it and be able to actually know what they mean and how it relates to like the verity of all the other taxa. So I think that to me, these are the sort of three key pieces about how we uh, uh, we might be able to tackle this, but it, 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 it requires a lot of tools that we don't have at the moment, I think. Thank, thanks, Denny. I, I'm wondering if we, we should hear from uh, Anne Fuchs. Uh, we haven't heard from yet. Uh, yes, sorry, I'll play um, one sec. No worries. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for joining us. And, and maybe just to introduce... Sorry, um, uh, I was a bit late. System. I got my... Okay, great. Uh, sorry, Anne here. I'm responsible for the National Species List in Australia, um, which basically has a name component and a backbone taxonomy. Um, I apologise for being a bit late. I got my Australian Eastern Standard Time change difference... Uh, confused and ended up being a bit late. Um, 
we i'm interested per, for our actual usage is at the publication stage whereby we're still manually having to capture concepts name synonymy into systems um, which we then can deliver to other people for usages so for me i i, I i've missed a little bit of the conversation but i think the, those three pillars that they just uh, was just talked about is a good starting point. Um, I think you kind of need to break the problem up into the past and the future. And I think if we don't address and try and do something about our standards for capturing this data now into future publications, then we just keep creating the, the, the problem goes on for longer. So um, I suppose I a bit of a plea to try and make this data available directly from taxonomic revisions in a way that we can ingest it, not have to re-enter it. Um, the other issues aren't so much related to the systems that I'm, I'm helping with. Um, they're more at the aggregation level. We're just a source of this confusion at that point. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Yeah, and, and then I, I guess Alex had another comment, and and just maybe before you comment, Alex, that your uh, your comment before about the, maybe we're like we're there's some confusion about taxonomic names and concepts, and it's like that's absolutely true. Like just throughout biodiversity science, um, certainly there's a, there's a temptation to just treat the names, and sometimes we have to, right? Like you're using the glo the global name service as like a that's an important first pass. But I think what we're trying to get out here is is how we can, uh, you know, really treat the the true changes that people are are making. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Uh, well, Dennis referred to it. There is a one to one relationship between many concepts and names, but the difficulties come where there's lots of compl complexity. Uh, I was just going to follow up uh, Anne's comment about the National Species List in Australia. Uh, that's been running for uh, 10 to 12 years maybe, uh, and it's entirely manual. Basically, it's arising from the taxonomic community in museums and herbaria, and lists are passed around from hand to hand in order to uh, consolidate a, a, a standard set of accepted names that can be used within Australia for the, the taxa that exist here, but it's entirely manual. Uh, but uh, I just thought I would mention that, that there is a model and, and Anne knows that model very well. Uh, it's, um, it's really important to get to a level where you can have a nationally accepted set of lists so that we feel confident that we're uttering the, the names with some certainty. Uh, it would be great to have further tools that streamline a lot of that for the, for the people who are maintaining those lists so they can just concentrate on the really tricky ones. Yeah, thank you. So unfortunately, I think we're at our time, right, Nate? Um, so thanks to everyone who uh, got up really early or stayed up really late with us. Um, I think there's- I wanted to say something. I mean, can we give him a minute? <laughs> oh, okay, well, uh, feel uh, it's been a pleasure to have everyone if you have to go. Um, we can hold on here for a few more minutes uh, to keep talking. It's been really, uh, I think, getting to some important issues. All right, so Cam, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, I, this is the first time I've heard of the Australian phrase names, and uh, those seem like to be actually taxon concepts because I don't think they'll ever be reused in any other concept. So that I just thought that was a really cool thing. Never heard of that. Um, I like that. Yeah, we, we sort of. Uh invented it in uh, about 1995 and uh, agreed that to the, the format and how you would uh, use in the name a pseudotype concept by citing an actual specimen uh, uh, via uh, collector and collector's number. It's very simple and straightforward, but uh, it really helps track unpublished names uh, where we need to conserve these taxa. Right. Well, I think um, just to wrap up, you know, I've, I've been wondering to what extent can there be something that we move toward together? And it, it does sound like things like getting toward checklists that we can compare with automated tools at a pretty large scope, dividing the past and the future, um, uh, you know, having the automated tools like Dennis is just describing that help 
uh, mash things up going forward. Um, those all comparing data models, et cetera, those seem like shared themes and maybe there's something where we can follow up together and start to uh, think about uh, concerted fronts in this regard of, of uh, to, to Jeff's issue of maybe we can't uh, do everything simultaneously, but we can at least figure out what the agenda needs to be mm -hmm. and where we can concretely move forward on each of them step by step. All right, Nate, did you want to uh, say anything to close up? No, I'd just like to thank everyone. It's been really nice having such an international group and from all over the all over the world coming together on the same topic. So this is, this is awesome. And uh, we can make a TikTok for taxonomic concepts. I think that's the conclusion, right? <laughs> cool. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks again for joining. Okay. Thank Great you. Questions. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, really, really great. Bye-bye.